thought. We're here um, exploring this last category of mindfulness. And just as a reminder, you know, uh, to look back at where we've come from, we started with the six senses and just noticing and noting, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching or feeling. And then the sixth sense, the mind sense, thinking. And this has really been the sort of basic foundation that everything else has been built upon. Um, we took the fifth sense of touching or feeling, the tactile sense, and we expanded that to look at all the different ways that we experience our body in the first category of body sensations. And then we investigated how every bodily sensation, if we really pay attention, we can notice that it has a kind of charge to it, that it's either pleasant, unpleasant, or it doesn't have either of those. It's a neutral charge, or you could say it has no charge. Um, and we practice with kind of connecting our experience of the body and our noticing of that charge. We then further looked at, uh, in the third category, mind states, looking at um, how these bodily sensations that have a charge with them come together with our thinking sense and sometimes form these particular kinds of discernible patterns that we call mind states, or we call emotions or attitudes, or non-ordinary states of consciousness, things that don't fit into either the emotions or attitudes bucket, and yet are clearly a combination of body and mind sensations. And today, uh, we'll wrap this up by taking that sixth sense of thinking and expanding it too, in the same way that we did with the, with the fifth sense, with the tactile sensation. We'll just unpack it and sort of see what are the different ways that we experience the mind or thought. And there are two particular ways that I want to talk about this um, that I found helpful in uh, understanding thought myself and also in teaching uh, people how to become mindful of their own thinking process. And the first way is of thinking about thought in terms of thought being internal sense impressions. So if you look at the six senses again, we have the five physical senses and then we have the sixth sense we call mind in this framework. But how exactly do we experience mind at the most basic level? And here, the understanding is that we experience mind, these internal sense impressions, in the same exact way that we experience the physical world through the five senses, except that it's mental, it's internal. It's not coming from outside in, it's coming from inside. But we use the same basic elements of seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting to construct our mental environment. So we have visual thoughts. We see things in our mind's eye on the internal screen of our mind, which is in some ways just like the screen in which we perceive the external visual world. We don't see things behind us. We see things kind of in front of us and to the sides. We also hear internal auditory thoughts. We hear oftentimes the, uh, our own voice, like self-talk, or we hear words. Sometimes they're not even our words. And sometimes we can even just hear a kind of simmering, bubbling activity in the inner ear space. And we, again, we hear thoughts in the same way that we hear sounds, in the same kind of spatial way. we can have an internal sense of our body, uh, kinesthetic thoughts. Uh, you could say we can imagine what it feels like, for instance, to be hurt. Have you ever kind of uh, got into this kind of uh, thought train loop where you start to imagine something bad happening to you and you can feel the pain and you kind of wince? Or even if you see someone else experiencing something painful and you wince, I mean, there's a sense in which we can imagine the feeling of the bodily feeling of something without actually having that happen to us. And it's as if it's real, you know, when we, when we empathize with someone who's in pain, it's like, ah, it actually feels real. This is the internal kinesthetic sense. We also experience this oftentimes when there's a kind of impulse that arises to do something, what the early Buddhists call volition or intention or about to -ness. If you've ever noticed that, you're about to kind of move your hand to go pick up your water, or you're about to swallow, or you're about to think, 
even. There's this moment of about to of a kind of rising sense of impulse. And then sometimes, and oftentimes, there's then the action itself. But not always. Sometimes the impulse can arise. We notice that kinesthetic impulse. And then there can be a release and a relaxing. And we don't follow our impulses all the time. One of the great benefits of mindfulness practice is, is developing the capacity to not be always pushed around by our impulses. Uh, and then we can have, though it's not as common, um, to experience olfactory and gustatory thoughts. You know, we can imagine uh, tasting and smelling things, um, particularly if you're fantasizing about a good cookie, or as I often do, or uh, about a good meal. You can imagine, you can smell, and you can taste something internally in your mind. Uh, and all of these are ways that we can sense uh, through the mind, these internal sense impressions. And I'd like to add, there's another special way that we can work with thought in, in, in these terms. And that is we can also notice when there's a lack of activity happening in any of these internal sense fields. When there's a lack of visual activity, you might notice that there's a, just a kind of blankness on, on, in the mind's eye, that there's nothing really happening there. And, and I often just note that as blank. Um, uh, Shinzen Young has a great um, note for this as well. He calls this sea rest because there's the seeing internally, but then there's rest. There's nothing happening. We could note that as thinking rest or even no thinking. Um, so there's different ways that we could also work with noticing the lack of activity that's happening. Sometimes we might notice that there's just a quietude in the internal mind's eye. There's no, there's no dialogue going on. There's nothing we're telling ourselves about ourselves in that moment. And there's just this kind of quiet. Or you could note it as Shinzen does, hear rest. Um, and likewise, with all of the senses, you can tune in and notice sometimes there's no activity, and that is what's happening. And we can be aware of the lack of activity and notice that. So these are all ways of working with uh, the sixth sense, seeing it in terms of these internal sense impressions. And you know, being, uh, being a, a super geek uh, that I am, uh, you know, I've, I've been thinking a, a lot in the last several years about the development of virtual reality and art of uh, augmented reality and kind of what the significance is of those technologies. And, and, and one of the things I, I, uh, it prompts me to consider is that the thinking mind, you know, our neocortex, our capacity to have these internal sense impressions to represent the world to ourselves and to represent ourselves to ourselves. Um, that is, in, in some ways, the original virtual reality and augmented reality. That is uh, evolution's current um, development of the, of the capacity to generate these uh, worlds that don't actually exist in the physical space and physical place. And it's interesting because as human beings, we don't just go into virtual reality or augmented, you know, turn on our augmented reality thought technology. It's always operating. Whether we're awake or asleep, we're always generating these worlds to ourselves and ourselves to ourselves and each other to ourselves. Um, and in a way, the, the, the mind sense is intermingling always with the physical senses. And so it's all coming together. So if our eyes are closed, you might notice that it kind of feels more like virtual reality. Your mind is like VR. You're immersed in your own thoughts. Oftentimes, it's like a whole world sometimes when we become absorbed in a thought. It's like, and we, then we, we, we wake up from the thought and suddenly it's like we exit that application and we're back here. It's like, oh, wow, that was trippy. Um, but we don't really think of it as being all that trippy because that's just, you know, what we're used to. Um, now people are putting on VR headsets and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so real. I'm like, yeah, that's just like your mind. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it's always been. <laughs> Uh, and same with augmented reality. You know, if you, your eyes are open, you know, you had an augmented reality glasses on, let's say, it's projecting images into the space. Well, we already have that technology. We're always projecting not just images, but all the other senses into our experiential field. We're thinking and knowing experience that's coming in um, from outside from here as well. And it's all kind of, again, intermingling and overlapping and um, our thoughts are augmenting our experience of the world. So, so that's the internal sense impressions. And then the second way that I, I would um, suggest that we could 
um, think about thoughts. Because we're, again, even just the, the whole idea of there being four categories, this is a mental schema. We're using thought to understand our experience and to learn how to work with it. Um, so this is, this is a skillful use of, of this capacity of mind. Uh, or sometimes it can be unskillful, depending. Um, the second way that we could think about thoughts is we can kind of notice in the same way that the, the five senses come together with the mind in these different combinations, these combinatorial patterns of experience that we call body and mind states and thoughts, all these things, when they come together, um, they form something new. In the same way, our sensory mental impressions, they can come together. Instead of just noticing a, a, like a kind of random image popping through the mind's eye, you might notice, oh, there's a car. And you might have the internal auditory talk going on. There's a car. At the same time that this image rolls through your visual screen, the same time that you're hearing externally sound. And all these things come together at the same time to form our sense of car. There's a car going by, and we know there's a car. But actually, that sense of there being a car, uh, it's made up of all these different sense impressions. And sometimes our thoughts come together to form, actually, many times uh, during the day, they come together to form stories. You know, we actually start to think in terms of a storyline. Um, and what is a story? Well, I'd say a story, at the very least, it has to have a, a, a one character. And, and, you know, we all know who the main character tends to be in, in the story of our mind. Uh, it's us. Uh, we are usually the protagonist and the antagonist of, of, our, own, of our own story. Um, but there can be others, you know, others that appear in our storyline. And often do. Um, and then there's the other element to a story, which is time. There has to be some kind of movement through time for there to be a story. Uh, and this is what kind of makes thought so interesting, is that thought enables us to time travel. Um, if you think about your experience with the body and body sensations, say the first category, when you're just noticing sensations and being in the body, of course there actually is thought going on, but let's just say for a moment, you could really just fully be in the body and inhabiting the tactile physical sensations of the body. In that moment of immersion in the sensory experience of body, we aren't time traveling. There is the sense of opening to a timeless presence of just this, thisness. And that's a lot of what Buddhist contemplative practices aim for, is the cultivation and development of that capacity to be present, to not be completely lost in thought. Um, but of course, we continue to produce thoughts. Um, Joseph Goldstein has this great saying, you know, the mind produces thoughts like the mouth produces saliva. We're not gonna get rid of our thoughts, I would argue, in this practice but we might be able to attenuate the amount that we get absorbed in our thoughts and lose our bodies. Um, and I think that's a great skill to have, but it's also great that we do are able to time travel, you know, that we can remember the past. We can experience remembering thoughts recalling thoughts that we can plan into the future. We have planning thoughts. We have rehearsing thoughts, you know, where we actually, um, are planning out what we're going to say and we're rehearsing it before we have the conversation. Um, you know, we have all these kind of simulation type thoughts where we're, we simulate future scenarios and we run through it over and over again until we feel kind of confident that we have some idea of the things that might happen. Of course, we're <laughs> often wrong, but still, you know, it's helpful to do that. It actually gives us the capacity to move into uncertain situations with some sense of what's could happen and, and how we might be in that situation. We also simulate the past. Have you noticed this? Uh, someone pointed this out in earlier, uh, one of the groups that they noticed uh, reliving thoughts that they'll actually, you know, we can experience remembering and then simulating that memory and changing little bits of it and kind of re rehashing the past, uh, re-simulating the past such that some different outcome occurs than what actually happened. <laughs> Uh, and who knows, maybe when we do this, we actually also are changing our memory of ourselves and the experience, um, remembering ourselves. 
differently. And here's what's trippy, I find, is that we can also think about the present. Um, we have present tense thoughts. Uh, and this can be confusing sometimes because a lot of um, the popular understanding of meditation is that we're just learning how to be in the present. Um, but then we also say, well, we don't want to get absorbed in thought because thought takes us out of the present. But we can also think about the present. Um, we can analyze what's happening right now. We can have analyzing thoughts. We can evaluate or judge what's happening right now, evaluating, judging thoughts. All of those kinds of thoughts are, are happening in the present tense. And then we can have um, you know, thoughts that span time. Uh, one of my favorites is you know, comparing thoughts. It's like I'm, 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 I'm having this experience now and I'm noticing it, and then I'm comparing it to some uh, situation or, or memory from the past. Oh, like this isn't as nice as it was last time I did the practice, the social learning practice. I wish it were like that. Oh, fantasizing, wishing, comparing, pet present, past, and future, all kind of getting mixed up together. And so we can note thought in terms of the storyline too. Um, if you have a thought and then you notice uh, that it isn't just a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic um, thought, but instead, it's got a storyline to it. It's got a theme, and you can identify what that kind of thought is. You could note that, planning thought, preparing thought, rehearsing thought, remembering thought, recalling thought, whatever uh, words work for you to help kind of identify the storyline of the thinking mind. And so these are two different ways that we'll work with um, here exploring the nature of thought.